This morning, I want to speak out of James chapter 4 on this subject, why prayer fails. Admittedly, it will be somewhat negative. But I want to mention something to you that should help you uh, to endure this, if nothing else. I have been brooding over these things all week long. And the Lord has been eating my lunch with it all week long. So if this turns out to be a little much, which of course I hope it is not, remember you only get it for 30 minutes. I've had it for seven days. Amen? Amen. You think that'll help you a little bit? All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Brother Camp, would you lead us in prayer, please, before I preach? Heavenly Father, thank you for this privilege and opportunity to come together and sing these songs of praise unto you and open up your word. And Lord, we just pray that you apply your word to our hearts and help us through the week as we remember daily your word and what you mean to us. Thank you for saving our soul and thank you for everything you do for us. And thank you for that song. God will take care of you. And Lord, we truly have and, uh, and will. And, and Lord, just bless now. And Brother George, <coughs> But 
we believe it may well be the first book written in the New Testament because it was written to all the saints instead of to a local church. As a matter of fact, the word church is not even mentioned in this book. Grace is not discussed in this book. There is no hint of New Testament order in this, in this book. So we think it may well be the earliest book. The subject matter of the book of James is outward service as proof of inward faith. In other words, faith produces works. There, the Old Testament parallel to the book of James is the book of Proverbs. And like Proverbs, the book of James discusses a myriad of uh, subjects. Testing of faith, the tongue, worldliness, riches, obedience, trials, love, sickness, and prayer. The subject matter this morning is prayer. Absolutely necessary. Your Christian life spiritually will not rise above the level of your commitment to the Word of God and prayer. That is an axiom. Just as the spiritual life of the church will not rise above its level of commitment to the Word of God and prayer. John chapter number 16, verse number 23 and 24. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, in other words, hearken, hearken, because ah, the Lord is fixing to say something very important. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Now let me stop there and turn that around. Whatsoever you don't ask, you don't get. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. I hope, I pray that the Lord will never say that about me. Uh, I would desire, a spiritual desire for you that the Lord will never look at your life and say that. Either two of you has nothing in my name. I would hope and pray that uh, uh, that will never be said about this church. I'm glad, really glad, that the men come early, most of you come early, and we meet in the room here in the corner and have a season of prayer. That's a good foundation to build a church on. Hitherto, if you ask nothing in my name, and then there is this very short lesson of prayer, ask. Dr. Rice used to like to say, prayer is asking, the answer is the receiving. Ask, and you shall receive. Then notice this, that your joy may be full. You know, we Christians are different from the rest of the world. We don't have to have everything in life perfect. We don't have to have everything going our way to still rejoice. We've got someone inside of us that we can rejoice. The world does not understand that. They have to have everything just right. And if not, they'll moan and groan. The Apostle Paul, writing from prison, writing to a persecuted, said, Church said, Rejoice in the Lord. And again I say, Rejoice. When you have bathed the day in spiritual prayer, you can get up off your knees and you go on and rejoice that day knowing that God is in control. When the men of the church meet back here in this corner room, 
on Sunday morning. We've asked the Lord to be here. And we've asked the Lord to help us and to guide us and to receive the glory. Then we leave that room. And whatever may happen today, we can still rejoice because we know we have committed ourselves and the work to the Lord Jesus Christ. And by faith, He is working amongst us. Amen. In the book of James chapter 4 are seven reasons why God sometimes does not answer our prayers. They're very simple. They're very obvious. They're as plain as the nose on your face. But let's walk through them and let's just never mind who's sitting next to you. Let's just concentrate on these and think about this and say, Lord, speak to my heart. So here we go. Number one, we don't ask. We'll take the most obvious one first. We don't ask. Verse 2, ye have not because ye ask not. Now let me illustrate. Before you came to church this morning, did you pray? Did you ask God to bless our time together? Did you ask God to control my stammering tongue? Did you pray for our teachers? Did you pray for the Lord to be glorified? The challenges of our lives, and we all have them. There's not a perfect person in here today, not up here and not out there. We all have challenges. Have you, have you committed that to the Lord in prayer? Do you begin each day by seeking the Lord and His blessing and His will? You see, the truth, the biblical truth is that prayerlessness is sin. First Samuel 12, 23. Samuel said, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, the people he was dealing with. But let me apply that to each one of us. God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray. Prayerlessness is practical atheism. Think with me. Here's a man who says he's an atheist, so he doesn't pray. Here's a man that says he's a Christian, but he doesn't pray either. Who's worse? <coughs> Every sin is ultimately a sin of prayerlessness. The most obvious reason we don't ask. Number two, wrong. Asking, we ask, but it's wrong asking. Verse three: You ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Now, uh, let me tell you, I, I find this one a little strange in view of what people are being taught today to pray for, what people are being promised if they'll become Christians. They're being promised health and wealth and prosperity, and a bigger house, and a bigger car, and, uh, and, and all kinds of goodies. Yet the Bible says you ask a miss if you ask because you consume it upon your lust. Look, can we just be real practical this morning? If the house you're living in today is all right, just live in it. Don't ask God for a big one. If your car is running all right, don't bother to ask God for another one. If you're making enough money to get by, be content. Now, if you really need a car, pray for it. If your house is falling down on top of you, pray for another one. Amen. But if you're all right where you are physically, and you want more, now you're asking God, for stuff so you can consume upon your lust to God's not going to do that. Let me make a challenge to you. You know, the first century of Christians were the poorest people in the world. 
They were most of them were slaves. Everything they owned was on their back. When you study the prayers of the men and women in the Bible, only twice would you ever find in the New Testament where somebody prayed for something physical. All the prayers were for spiritual blessings. And then think about what's going in our, on in our society today. We are so blessed with overabundance, it's not even funny anymore. And yet we want more. Now I think we need to learn to be content with where we are. Yeah. And with what we have. When I was a little boy, that was before dirt, everybody lived in a, in, in a two-bedroom house, and not a big one either, a two-bedroom house with one bathroom, and it didn't matter if there were seven kids. We got raised in that kind of an environment. And now everybody lives in three-bedroom, four-bedroom, three, four-bathroom houses, and we still have to go down to this corner and rent a storage place to house it all. And we're still not happy. You ask a mist that you may consume it upon your lust. Hmm. What does that mean? Well, that means asking for things contrary to God's will. You know, you can pray for anything you want to, but, you, but before you say amen, you better say, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. That's good for him. Amen. It means asking for things contrary to the Word of God. It means asking for things contrary to the Spirit of God, what He's telling you. It's asking for things to promote the flesh. Christians aren't supposed to promote the flesh, they're supposed to subdue it. The unbeliever lives totally for the flesh. The believer lives for the spirit. Now that doesn't mean mistreat your body. Take care of yourself. It's the only tent you're going to live in in this life. I like what... I just went blank. Paul Harvey. Yeah, it came back to me. I like what Paul, I heard Paul Harvey say years ago. He said the average American spends the first 35 years of his life destroying his body and the next 35 trying to put it back together. <laughs> Don't do that. Take care of your body. And by the way, guys, when you hurt, don't be macho. Go see the doctor. Now, what it is about guys? Well, we got to be tough. I'm going to stick this in the other. You can, I must not be very tough. I mean, uh, if I hurt, I'm going to take an aspirin. If that doesn't cure it, I'm going to go to the doctor. Take care of your body. Your usefulness to God, let alone to your family and to yourself, will not rise above your physical health. Take care of yourself, but don't worship your body. It's asking for things to promote the flesh. It's asking for things that do not honor God. How about this one, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him that's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church. Amen. Wrong asking. By the way, you have to read your Bible to know how to ask right. God always honors his promises. If there's a promise God has made in the Bible, that's a spiritual check that you can write and take to God and say, God, you said. You say, that's being presumptuous. No, that's real spiritual. Number three, the friendship of the world. Verse number four. The adulterers and adulteresses. Now that is spiritual adultery. The adulterers and adulteresses. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Let me liken spiritual adultery to a man and woman are married to each other. They are committed to each other to be faithful to each other. And one or both go outside those bonds and have a uh, outside of marriage sexual relationship. That's called adultery. Spiritual adultery is this, 
as believers, we belong to the Lord. We are committed to the Lord. We are holy. He is. He has all of us. But we still love the world and we still want to dilly dally around the world. That's called, when you mix the world and God, that's called spiritual adultery. Carnal living, worldly living, a divided heart. This world is not the friend of a Christian. Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. From this side of the desk, I'm, I'm gravely concerned over much of Christendom today that uh, uh, claim to be Christian and claim to belong to the Lord, but their lives don't differ any from anybody else in town. Now, folks, that's problematic. Amen. Because the Bible says, Yea, they that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Friendship with the world. Number four, lack of submission to the Lord. Verse seven, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. I can remember as a child, and I suspect every boy and girl in the building can relate to this. Uh, when, when, when everything was all right between my parents and I, and I was in their favor because I was obeying them, I had no problem going to them. I, I had no reserve about going to them and asking them for something because the relationship was right. But if I had disobeyed and I knew that I was out of sorts and they were out of sorts with me, I had a real hard time and I was real nervous by going to them about anything. That's how it is spiritually true. When your will is opposed to God's will and God's word, it's hard to pray. Matter of fact, Solomon said, if I get regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And, and, and the same Solomon in Proverbs said, if we despise the word of God, he won't hear our prayers. Lack of submission. Amen. John 17, 17 says, if any man will do his will, God will hear. We ought to have the spirit of the Apostle Paul on the Emmaus Road, uh, on the road to Damascus in 9 6. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Amen. Jesus said, I came not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Folks, when we give our life to the Lord Jesus Christ, we literally, body, soul, and spirit, belong to him. And his will, his desire, his glory is the primary motivation of our life. Amen. And it does affect our prayer life. Number five, we don't stay close to God. Verse eight, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Take the best friend you have, the closer you are to him, the more comfortable you will feel around him or her. That's, a, that's, a, that's true in any relationship. When distance separates people, relationships are no longer sweet and they become problematic. But when relationships are in one accord, Communion and free, open communion is the norm. Sometimes we just don't feel comfortable going to God because we know we're not as close to Him as we ought to be. It said about Enoch in Genesis 5.24, He walked with God. And if you want to learn the secret of Moses' successful life, it was his walk with God. He was close to God. He dwelt under the shadow of the Almighty, Psalm 91. God is in order of them. 
that diligently seek Him. Stay close to God. It will be a great encouragement in your prayer life. Amen. Number seven. Number six. Pride. Humble, verse 10, humble yourselves, therefore, in the sight of the Lord. I'm going to make a strong statement and then I'll prove it. God hates pride. God hates pride. Here's my proof. Proverbs 6, verse 16. These six things doth the Lord hate. And then the next verse, one of those is a proud look. When you're all puffed up and full of yourself, you're not in good fellowship with God. Amen. And God, as much as God hates pride, God loves humility. Because humility is a, a mistrust of self and a trust in God. Let's say the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and the holy place with him also, that is of a humble and contrite spirit. Amen. See, pride in a nutshell is self over God. And God came by that. What's the solution to pride? The Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. closer you get to God. See, the more you're in the Bible and the closer you get to God, the more you're going to find out how little we are and the more you're going to find out how great He is. And that is a great boon to a good prayer life. Pride. Number seven, the tongue. The tongue. Verse 11, speak not evil one of another brethren. There are right now a myriad of illustrations shooting through my brain of experiences that I could share, I won't, but I could, of things I've experienced in church life, of discord between members and members speaking evil one of another and how that hurts the church. Speak not evil one of another. Now that's not a suggestion. That's a, that's a command from God. Speak not evil one of another brethren. Let me go back to what I used a little bit ago. Proverbs 6. These six things doth the Lord hate. The seventh is an abomination. And when you go down there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the seventh one is, he that soweth discord amongst the brethren. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Oh, now, I don't know about you, but that's a sobering verse. You mean every sorry thing I ever said, God knows it? Yes. You mean every wrong thing I ever said, God wrote it down? Yes. You mean every word's going to come back to meet me? Yes. Now, that don't hush us up. There's no hope. Philippians 2 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus, when he was reviled, reviled not back. When he suffered, he threatened not. Let this mind be in us. Now, I said seven, but I'm going to give you one more and just mention it because it would be a whole sermon if I hadn't got off on this. At 1 Peter 3, 7, something else that will hinder your prayer is wrong husband-wife relationship. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. First there's admonitions to the wife. Then there's admonitions to the husband. And, and then it says, do these things because if not, your prayers will be hindered. 
See, a husband wives is a symbol, a picture of the church, Christ, the husband, the church, the bride. And so that's very important. Now, we'll give you four things in conclusion. Number one, we need to be honest with ourselves and confess that the prayerless, that prayerlessness is sin and wrong asking, if it's against the Bible, is also sin. Amen. God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray. That's very private between the person sitting right where you're sitting right now and the Lord. Number two, we need to stay humble before the Lord. God loves it when we stay. You know, don't, don't we love it when our kids stay dependent on us? Every parent has ever raised kids to tell you when they finally get independent and, and don't come around so much anymore. That, hurts us. We grieve over that. Well, so does your heavenly father. You're his child. He loves you. He wants to hear from you. He, he wants you to stay close to him. He wants you to depend on him. He wants you to talk to him. He wants you to ask him. You need to learn to stay humble before the Lord. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he makes all you in due time, casting all you care about him. For he careth for you. He's your heavenly father. Go to him. Talk to him. Tell him. He knows it anyway already. Number three. Commit yourself to the leadership and the help of the Holy Spirit. Who is your prayer helper. See, God, God the Father receives your prayers. But before he does that, they have to get run by the Son. Whoever lives to make intercession for you, Hebrews 7.25, and before they get run by the Son, they have to be generated in the heart by the Holy Spirit, who also help with our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. Amen. So we need the Holy Spirit to birth the prayer in us. And then we need to pray, and the Son takes them and makes them all right, and, and they give them to the Father who receives them. That's real praying. And then there just has to come that time, not because I'm preaching on this, that not, even though that ought to help, or not because some great crisis drives you to it, but as a as a loving relationship between you, the child, and your heavenly Father, there ought to be that constant, daily commitment to prayer. Amen. Matthew 6, 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. In other words, I don't mean literally, but symbolically, get alone and shut the door. And pray to thy father which is in secret. Thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Have I touched on something that has affected you? Take it to the Lord. <coughs> well, we're going to have an invitation here in a minute, but uh, and I'd be glad to pray with you if you'd like for me to, but this really is one of those sermons that speaks to the inner you may not necessarily require any outward response, but it requires a response from you in here. Let's stand. I tell you what I want to do, brother Mike. Uh, first of all, I, I just want everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes and go to Lane and just play something. And we'll sing a song in a little bit before we go home. But just bow your heads and close your eyes and think about this. It's between you and the Lord, brother Lane.